Back here to Ghana, where the oil is also in the news. The Tema Oil Refinery is clarifying reports it recorded a loss of 186 million CDs in its operations for last year. According to a statement from the state refiner, the said amount, which is out on social media, is inaccurate. Let's get some further explanation from the general manager in charge of finance, Daniel Apia. Thanks for your time tonight. What's the basis for this reportage, and can you bring us up to speed on your current financial situation? Hello. To some of them. Hello. Yes. Please go As ahead. As I've already indicated, this report that is out there in the media is a purely internal report. A report that is prepared monthly to explain variances between the actual and then the budgeted amount that we have put in there. In our report and in our budget. So it's a variance report and it's purely internal. I've always said that, look, I'm feeling constrained to speak to that, but it's out there so we can speak to it. But I don't know whether you have a copy of that report. It's quite self explanatory. We've shown the budgeted amounts and we've shown the actual and we've shown the variances and we've provided some explanations why we couldn't achieve budget. So specifically, what is your question? And so uh, you released a statement to clarify reports uh, sure. about your losses. So I guess the clarity people want is, is it really that uh, Tor is losing that much, really? Yes, I've provided some explanations on that press statement that we gave. And I think it's an explanation that people want to hear, no? Yeah, that's what we are um, trying to give you that explanation. Right. Yes, it's true that at the net profit level, we made a loss of one, 186 million Ghana cities. But what we're trying to say is that we made a gross profit. At a gross profit level, there was a profit of 12 million. And that's also significant because that shows that at the top level, we are making some profit. All right. In your statement. But when you come to. Hello? Go ahead. Uh huh. Then we have the operating expenses. When you take that one from the gross profit, that was what to throw the net loss. And the operating expenses, about 60% of the operating expenses, is made up of exchange loss and financial charges. And these charges and losses are calculated on our legacy debt. You know, those legacy debts are denominated in USD, and our reporting currency for toy CD. Mm. So anytime there is exchange rate depreciation, your debt denominated in U.S. dollars, when you convert into your reporting currency, we are bound to have some differences. And that's quite huge because Tesla has not been able to clear all the legacy debt in our books. All right. So, then, uh -huh. so based on these numbers, uh, would you say Tor is in a proper financial position? Yeah, if you, if you take out the exchange loss and differences, that, those ones are not, if you like, cash, actual out-of-pocket cash that's going on. You need to record it, though. Yes, if you look at the numbers critically, we are not doing bad at all. And, you know, when you compare it with historical numbers, we are making progress. It's it, just comparing actual variance that's what is throwing mm. those differences out. And By comparing com uh, historically, you know that we are doing, making progress. In your statement, you talk about uh, the fact that Tor is still facing uh, some liquidity challenges. Uh, talk to me about those current challenges uh, for which you're not able to implement your annual budget and meet your revenue target. Exactly. I mean, so the liquidity challenges mainly you know Tor is in the business of procuring crude oil, process it into refined products, and sell to the consuming public. Currently, because of our liquidity challenges, we are not able to raise the required LCs to procure the crude oil on continuous basis to process and then to you know sell and make some money. So that's the main factor which is underlying the results that we have published. All right. So we've talked about the problems you're facing right now. What kind of assistance does Tor need uh, to improve upon its financial position to become more profitable? Currently, government, you know, is the store shareholder of the company through the Ministry of Finance. Government has supported us currently with 700,000 barrels of crude oil, which we are processing currently. And we believe if our support can continue, it to go a long way to move our position from a net loss to a net positive position. 
All so right. if we follow the same trajectory that government is currently showing to us, you know, providing this crude oil for us to process, and then there are plans to provide subsequent parcels for us, if all those things can materialize, I think we'll be in a better position to report a profit. We, we are hoping for some good news in the near future. Thanks very much indeed for your time. Daniel Appiah is the general manager in charge of finance at the Tema Oil Refinery. Thank now, you there have been calls, some calls for government to review requirements for indigenous companies that want to acquire stakes in oil blocks which are being allocated. Local players are expected to provide 5% capital before they are allowed to partner with an international firm to acquire a block. However, getting companies to raise such capital has become a challenge. Speaking to Joy Business, Chairman of the Public Interest and Accountability Committee, Dr. Steve Mantial called for a downward review of the requirement. Common sense tells me that we may have to revise that 5% threshold. We are not under any obligation to impose a threshold that we know we cannot meet as part of the pre-qualification or as part of the award processes for contracts in the oil and gas sector. It's, it, it's for me symptomatic of how we do target setting in this country. Most of the times they appear as guesswork. Because if we have done proper due diligence, it should have become known to us long ago that the 5% capital requirement for Ghanaian participation in any block was overly too high. And that we could have actually staggered it. That perhaps within the first 10 years, we'll be aiming at 2%. And then beyond, when companies have been incapacitated enough, we now move up the threshold to about 5%. So definitely, yes, to your question, I think it becomes very necessary to revise the 5% requirement for indigenous Ghanaian company participation in, in blocks in the oil industry. Now, members of LPG Marketers Association of Ghana in Takwa, they have retreated the appeal to government to abolish or reduce considerably taxes on LPG. According to the association, the tax component plays on LPG has made the product expensive for consumers. Vice President of the organization, Gabriel Kumi, made their concerns known at a stakeholders forum organized by the National Petroleum Authority in Takwa. According to LPG Marketers Association, the tax components being placed on LPG products have constantly influenced the decision of marketers to cause avoidable increments of LPG price on the Ghanaian market. This, he explains, has made the product expensive for ordinary Ghanaians and affecting its usage. LPG is a product with an elastic demand. What that simply means is that if you raise the product, the price of the product, you are going to disenfranchise a lot of people from using the product. But if you bring the price down, you attract a lot of people into the consumption net so that consumption can be improved. But unfortunately, the price we are witnessing Presently, the price of LPG we are currently witnessing is so high that it will go a long way to diffuse and to to diffuse government objective of creating access and penetration. The conclusion will be that at the end of this year, we will per perform the performance will be lower than what we did last year. So LPG consumption has started going down. We strongly believe that if government does not remove the taxes on LPG immediately, consumption will continue to go down. There were equally other relevant concerns raised by domestic consumers, marketers, and commercial users. 
Away from energy matters and to a story that is developing, the Ghana Police Service will from tomorrow Tuesday deploy personnel at Opera Square in Accra to prevent a possible clash. This is after some members of the Ghana Electrical Dealers Association locked up shops owned by foreign, uh, foreigners at Opera Square here in Accra. The action resulted in the standoff and we understand the leadership of the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Guta, and the Nigerian Union of Traders are preparing for negotiations. Charles Aito was there and reports. Business came to a standstill at Opera Square, a hub for electrical retailers within the central business district of Accra. This area has been the center of confrontations between Ghanaian retailers and other foreign retailers. Earlier in the day, some Ghanaian traders who are members of the Ghana Electrical Dealers Association locked up shops allegedly owned by Nigerians at the Opera Square in Accra. The state government has failed to protect the retail space of Ghanaians. They believe taking the laws into their own hands could solve the issue. Not, not that we are doing demonstrating or something, you understand? We are just want the, the rules must be applied. The shutdown of the stores on Monday resulted in a standoff between both parties. This attracted heavy police presence. Chief Superintendent Kwesi Furi is the Accra Regional Operations Officer of the Ghana Police Service. We came in you know, to de-escalate the situation. At the moment, uh, we've been able to stop the continued closure of the sh foreign shops. And um, we are going that we've invited both factions, that the leadership of both sides, you know, to dialogue with us at the regional police headquarters. So we're going there and it's aimed at ensuring peace and security of the business district. President of the Nigerian Union of Traders Association, Chief Chukwema Inaji, expressed frustration over the incident. This is not the first time shops of Nigerians and other foreigners have been shut down. He believes a review of ECOWAS trading laws should solve this issue. If you go to Nigeria, so many Ghanaians sell in the street. They sell with vans. They sell just like we do. In fact, they sell bread, carry it on their head. They sell everything. Meanwhile, the Ghana Union of Traders Association, Guta, has accused the police of inhumane treatment to members and failing to enforce the law. Dr. Joseph Obain is president of Guta. Their ambassador need to talk to their members and that we have been so civil in our demands. They haven't done anything. The Nigerians who have come here haven't done anything. They have only seen a loophole in our laws and they are taking advantage of it. Current tussle between Ghanaian retailers and foreigners keeps brewing. A situation that begs the question of whether or not the safety, security and infiltration of the law is something that one would have to take up. The two sides have been in dispute for many years following confusion over whether to apply local laws which forbid foreign participation in retail trade or applying ECOWAS treaties that allow citizens to of citizens of member states to move freely and establish economically in other member states. And we've got eyes on that story for you. Let's turn to other news now. The Institute for Fiscal Studies, IFS, is making a case for government to reduce its appetite for borrowing from both local and international markets. According to the Institute, despite the consistent reduction in monetary policy rates, the Inflation, inflation and lending rates are still on the higher side. This was at a pre-budget review in Accra. Here is Ebenezer Sabote's report. Despite the Bank of Ghana's quest to drive down lending rates, the monetary policy rate has been maintained at 16% for the third time. Some businesses and retail leaders say they are yet to experience the manifestation of the significant reduction in interest rates. According to the Institute of Fiscal Studies, government's move to borrow more has contributed to the slow reduction in interest rates. Senior fellow at the IFS, Leslie Dwight Mensah, has been speaking ahead of the mid-year budget review. Where they will invest their deposits to generate yield. You know. And if you have a lot of demand for, for debt from government and, and quasi-government entities, okay, then they're going to pack more of their funds okay, in those in those securities and that could affect how much then they have left to lend to to the um, to their clients you know particularly in the, in the retail sector so there the, the, the could be a link as we have seen the average lending rate has responded slowest to the improvements in inflation and the decline in the policy policy rate 
Meanwhile, on revenue management, the Institute fears if government fails to tackle issues of compensation in the public, the economy might be weakened. Dr. Saeed Watch is an economist at the IFS. And not much can be done. In the long run, I feel things like um, compensation of employees, something drastically needs to be done in, in the long run. The government did work in 2017 by capping the transfer to these statutory fines. And we, we propose that the government has to review the whole program of these transfers, the year marking. The government took the easiest portion of what we proposed, that cap it, they did. But review it, some of these, um, those that are not so necessary, essential in the system, we can close them down and bring the monies involved to the center. Mm -hmm. The IFS is urging the Minister of Finance to implement measures that will open up employment opportunities for the youth in the extractive industry. Ibn Sabote's report for Joy Business. Meanwhile, Information Minister Kujo Mpongkuma has indicated the media review would focus on dealing with revenue mobilization challenges. The Finance Minister is expected to present the media review and a supplementary budget next Monday, that's July 29. Speaking ahead of the presentation, Information Minister Mr. Mpongkuma said the Finance Minister would outline measures to help improve the revenue situation. Now, the administration believes that it's steadily executing its commitment to Ghanaians and that this media budget review will afford it the unique opportunity to take a second look at revenue availability to execute the remaining programs, key among them being infrastructure. And that's why revenue mobilization, which was highlighted in the 2019 budget, will remain a key feature in the media review. The objective will be to ensure that government mobilizes enough resources to fully deliver on its outstanding commitments. It's refreshing to see the vigor with which Ghanaians have responded to the President's call to be citizens and not spectators. And as a result, you note that Ghanaians always call on government to deliver on this or deliver on that now. I'm sure you see all the hashtags, deliver on this now, deliver on that now. This same vigor will hopefully be translated into our revenue mobilization efforts to ensure that we fully fund and fully execute the outstanding programs in the medium term. Additionally, government is also commencing efforts to cut avoidable expenses. Key among them is ongoing work on cutting out capacity charges for power that we don't consume. Twenty-ninth of July, we can't wait for that presentation by the finance minister. Well, Managing Director of Zenith Bank, Henry Oro, has indicated that lending to businesses uh, could pick up strongly in the coming months. This follows concerns that some businesses are yet to realize the benefits of an improved banking sector confidence. Uh, Mr. Oro tells Joy Business the pickup has gotten to levels that can't, they can't confidently respond and improve credit to enterprises. Indeed, and naturally, the confidence of the public in the banking sector has increased and um, the dividends are beginning to trickle in. They will not happen overnight. You know, confidence builds and gets stronger every day. So I believe there's, we are all in the right direction. The banks are fewer and stronger, and the, public, the confidence of the public, the investing public, is even stronger today. And we've seen uh, deposits grow, you know, deposits grow, what it means is that most, more monies are coming into the financial system, so which is a good sign for the sector. Um, as we go into the future, I believe the impact will be more visible, the confidence will be stronger, it will take time, like I said, and the dividends will be even more tangible. MD, would this impact on your credit loan advances, none that things are picking up again, because some are still complaining that there is some liquidity squeeze in the system, and therefore, if these things are picking up and the banks are picking on the dividend of this, will that impact on uh, Senate Bank's credit portfolio, loan advances to the private sector? Right, it definitely will, it will take time. You know, you don't create loan in one day. You know, the process of loan creation takes time, and um, and um, if you ask me, even the 
the average learning rate has even come down in a, in, in a couple of years. Don't forget, learning rate was up about 24%, 25% about a couple of years ago. Today, most banks are lending under 20%, 18%, 90%, even 17%, sometimes 16%, and the policy rate is at uh, 16 So if you ask me, those rates have, have trended down. They will still come down. You know, uh, don't forget, the banks have just, some of these banks still remember the, the failures of a few months ago. And those, that, that, um, that fear, if you, if you ask me, is still there on the part of banks. But over time, they overcome that fear mm -hmm. and become to actively lend to the, the lower sector. And that is when, when they start lending more to that sector, that is when the rates will be pushed down. You're still watching Business Live. In the coming years, corporate organizations may be compelled to buy compulsory insurance products for their employees. This is because the National Insurance Commission says it is working hard to protect the lives and properties of innocent third parties in the event of an accident. The Deputy Commissioner of Insurance, Michael Andor, made this known in an interview with Joy Business at the Chartered Insurance Institute of Ghana's 2019 induction ceremony. This Mark Awusa has more. This year, the National Insurance Commission, NIC, hinted it was working to expand the basket of mandatory insurances in the country. According to the Commission, this is part of efforts to increase insurance penetration rates to double digits by 2021. Speaking to Joy Business, the Deputy Commissioner of Insurance, Michael Lando, said discussions on the subject matter are currently at the committee level. We all saw the Mercom disaster, we saw the June 3 disaster. Now, if these companies, if the filling station had a public liability insurance, that would have gone a long way to take care of, of the victims. Recently, I saw some of them on TV, on the radio, complaining nobody cares about them. The day the thing occurred and the few days after, there were cameras all around, but now what is happening? Meanwhile, government says plans are far advanced to introduce a new insurance bill. According to the director of FSD at the Ministry of Finance, Samson Akligo, the new bill, if passed, will validate the new compulsory insurance products. And there's more news as always on our website, myjoinline.com forward slash business. That's it for Business Live. My name is Daryl Kwao. Thanks for watching.